Hello, this is Chuck Carnevale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. I'm really excited to present this video today on Amazon, one of the most interesting companies that I've ever had to analyze in my almost 45 going on 50 year career. The reason I think Amazon is such an interesting company to analyze is because it has one of the best historical performance results, you know, total returns to shareholders of any company I've ever analyzed. It also has one of the worst records of profitability of any company I've analyzed. So what I've got on the screen here is a graphing of Amazon's profits per share going back to 1999. Now, what I want you to notice here, and it's very important, is the company lost money in the first three years here, all the way through 2001. Of course, we had the recession here, the 2001 recession. Then they actually started making a little bit of profit. You can see it's been very cyclical. And then they actually went through the recession with great operating history. I'm looking at operating earnings here. And then starting in 2010, their earnings have been very erratic. So the company, to say the least, is not a very profitable enterprise. And just to put that into perspective, let me take a quick look at FunGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, and look at Amazon's gross and net profit margin. When I take a look at Amazon's gross and net profit margins using the percentage graph here in FunGraphs, I want you to notice that their gross margins are okay, especially for a retailer. They're in the 19 to 25% range. More recently, they've actually gone into the 30% range. But their gross profit margins are pretty nice. But the problem is, their net profit margins really where the problem is. As you can see, there are many, many years when Amazon, even in recent years, has negative gross profit margins. As Jeff Bezos has stated numerous times, everyone else's margin is his opportunity. So going back to the fast graphs and looking at adjusted operating earnings here, as you can see, it's what I have plotted, and you see this erratic thing. If this graph would indicate that Amazon's stock price should be tracking these operating earnings like most companies do. But Amazon does things differently. As I said in the written portion of this article, Jeff dances to his own drum. He basically follows his own path, a path not very widely taken by most people. So how did the market price Amazon stock relative to this historical earnings record? It's very important here. I have no estimate data. This is pure history. This is all actual historical operating results. So when I put price on this graph, this is the weirdest price and earnings relationship I think I've ever seen. You can see that earnings, of course, you almost can't see them now because the price is so high relative to the theoretical value of Amazon's earnings. But yet you can see the price has consistently gone up. Now, very simply stated, there's no earnings to support this lofty price. Now, what's interesting, though, is I add these estimate years for 2018 and then I add for 2019, and then I add forecasts for 2020, and the analysts are expecting a very high surge in earnings growth over these next three years. So, you know, that's promising, but yet up until now, Amazon has gotten away with this very high stock price with very little in the way of earnings to support it. So, you know, Amazon is not a very profitable company. So what is giving Amazon its value? Is this the most ridiculously valued stock we've ever seen? Well, let's look at it from some other perspective. However, before I go on, let's look at what kind of performance has been created. I've changed the graph here to 2002 because I tried to find a point where valuation might have made some sense. And a $10,000 investment made on December 31st, 2001 in Amazon would be worth $1,248,000 today. And you compare that to investing the same 10,000 into the S&P 500, it would have only just a little more than doubled your money. So obviously it's a rhetorical question as I posed in the written portion, would you rather have a million two or 22,000? you know, over this time frame as an investor. So Amazon has produced operating results. But let's go ahead and look at the other metrics. Let's start by looking at diluted earnings. And I have a reason for doing that. This is uh, earnings under gap. This would be gap earnings. And you can see their earnings record and their gap record is very similar to their adjusted operating record. Let me take price off again so you can see it. But it's cash flow. You know, Jeff has always talked about free cash flow. So let's look at free cash flow per share, first of all. Let's look at the type of cash flow that Amazon has generated. And when you look at Amazon from the point of view of free cash flow, you can see that Amazon is really generating a lot of excess cash to be able to fund their growth. And you can see that historically. Now, when you put price on here in relationship to this free cash flow, you still see 
this real high valuation. But I don't really like to value a company based on free cash flow because the multiples are always going to be high because this is the money that's left over. So let's look at kind of a, a soft or weak form of cash flow. Let's look at earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization or EBITDA. And this really, I think, articulates Amazon's growth. Now, again, I can take the forecasts off of here again and just look at the historical data through 2017. And you can see that historically, Amazon has traded at a normal price to EBITDA of about 41. Now, that's a very high price to EBITDA, but nevertheless, it is the price to EBITDA that the market has been willing to capitalize Amazon on. Now, when you look at the growth of EBITDA, considering that the growth of EBITDA has averaged over 30% during this historical time frame, it, it becomes easy to see why the market is applying such a high multiple. Now, forecast EBITDA is extremely exciting right now. The market is forecasting some really astounding growth. So let's go ahead and look real quick at the forecasting calculators. Now, for starters, I have a reasonable consensus here. I have 20 analysts forecasting 2018 EBITDA per share of almost $55 per share. Assume it met this expectation of EBITDA growth and continued to trade at this 41 0.8 EBITDA or even down here at a 30 EBITDA, you can see the rates of return expectations on Amazon over the next year or two would be extremely high. But there's a big caveat here, assuming they achieved this growth, number one, and assuming the market continued to apply that kind of multiple. So when I go to the normal multiple graph, you can see that the market historically has been valuing Amazon at, at really close to a 40 multiple. On the low side, I'll use the lowest, which is more recently, it would be a little high on a current valuation, but due to the growth, you still have these 40%, you know, 37%, even out to three years, averaging 35% rates of return. And that's assuming it grew EBITDA at this rate, as these analysts are expecting, and it traded at an, a price to EBITDA, as I've got you know, depict at 33.9. So from a basis of EBITDA, if you look at Amazon and, and how the market has priced it based on EBITDA, you see this very, very high correlation somewhere around a 40 multiple. So they definitely are producing a lot of earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. This is a growing business. Moving on now to operating cash flow, you can see again, you've got this relationship where Amazon has traded at about a normal priced operating cash of about 25. So I'll go ahead and put that number. That's the blue line here. Their growth, their pay ratio of one, if you will, to operating cash flow, they've grown operating cash flow at over 31% a year. And that's including the forecasts that are being in there. But you can see the valuation relative to operating cash flows has been very, very profound. So what does this say about Amazon's valuation? Well, based on operating cash flow and based on EBITDA, the company really is not that overvalued. In fact, it might be even a very excellent long-term investment here. You can see that even on a price-to-sales basis, it's trading at a reasonably normal price-to-sales. I don't think it's cheap based on a price-to-sales, nor do I think it's expensive. But remember, this company pays no dividends. There are no dividends on this graph. You know, there's nothing on here to check on dividends. So everything is about capital appreciation. And thus far, I think it's very clear that the market has been looking at cash flows and even weak forms of cash flows like EBITDA a lot more than they've been looking at earnings. Now, could this company become an earnings generator? Possibly. But let's look a little deeper into some of the financial metrics of Amazon now. I'm going to start out by taking a look at capital expenditures real quick because this is one thing and I'm going to use a line graph here. I think it's just a little easier to see. You can see that Amazon, you know, generates or spends a lot of money on CapEx. They are a growth stock and they are doing things to continue to fund that growth. And remember, the focus here is on free cash flow. Next, let's take a look at cost of goods sold here. And you can see that the Amazon has had a steadily increasing cost of goods sold, but that ties into their growth. Let's add revenues to this graph. And you can see that their revenue growth has been dramatic and tremendous. Let's go ahead and do it with a bar graph here. And you can see revenues have consistently grown. So Amazon is a growth stock. They've been growing revenues by over 38% a year on average, going all the way back to 1997. They don't bring a lot to the traditional bottom line, which is called operating earnings per share. But the company does bring their own free 
cash flow to the bottom line. Let's look at that just a little bit deep. With this screenshot here, I've gone to S&P Capital IQ, which is the source of all the data you find on fast graphs. And what I've graphed here, I've got a five-year graph up here of levered and unlevered free cash flow. The levered free cash flow is the light blue and the unlevered free cash flow is the darker blue or darker green, if you want to call it here. And what it really boils down to is that if you're looking at these cash flows, there was several articles written recently that, you know, they're not really reporting all of their free cash flows correctly because they have these server obligations, these five-year amortization schedules. Well, I have a couple of problems with that. One is the servers are going to last longer than five years. That's their accounting. You know, that's how they're depreciating them off. Now, they are going to be replacing servers from time to time, but a lot of the servers that they've amortized over five years are still going to be functioning. The bottom line is when you're looking at levered and unlevered free cash flow, both of them will appear on the balance sheet. And levered free cash flow is interesting because it indicates how much cash a business has to expand. So when we're looking at levered cash flow here, you can see that Amazon is producing quite a bit of levered cash flow. Now, unlevered cash flow is important because Unlevered free cash flow is the cash available f to a company after all of its capital expenditures and taxes have been paid, but before any financial obligations have been accessed. So you can see here, no matter how you're measuring Amazon's cash flow, whether you're using levered or unlevered, the company is a prodigious generator of cash. I want to go into the Emilians graph here and I want to look at their record of issuing shares historically. This is common shares outstanding. In 1997, Amazon had 290 million shares. In 2017, they had 484 million shares. And you can see that they've been consistently raising shares and obviously raising capital through the sale of shares. And they're doing it, in my opinion, smartly because their stock price is so high relative to their earnings that it's a great time to be issuing shares. They're getting maximum value for the company. Now, based on cash flows, which is what Jeff Bezos focuses on, the company's you know, doing fine. It's not as overvalued, but it's still fully valued. So I love the fact that this company has the financial flexibility to go ahead and you know, raise money if they need to. They got ample cash flows to run their business. Their operating cash flows are extraordinary. So the bottom line is Amazon may look crazy when you try to value the stock based on earnings, but when you look at cash flows and the correlation, the way this market has priced this relative to operating cash flows is extraordinary. And free cash flows, as I mentioned earlier, isn't necessarily as good a valuation because the price isn't going to track free cash flow as much. But what free cash flow is telling us, does the company have you know, ample money to utilize to expand and grow their business? And it's quite clear that Amazon is a cash flow producing machine. Amazon is a strong company. They generate incredible revenues. They generate incredible cash flows. And in the long run, their price has been tracking those cash flows quite nicely and still does. Now, on a normal price to cash flow, it would be a little overvalued, but relative to its future growth, you would still stand to make a lot of money on Amazon. The real question is, how long is the market going to continue to allow Amazon to eschew trying to earn any money or at any net profit and allow them to continue to value their stock based on cash flows. The, the, the dichotomy between earnings and price is ridiculous, but when you look at it from softer forms of cash flow like EBITDA and operating cash flow, you see these incredible correlations. So Amazon may be crazy, but it's not totally crazy. There is a lot of value in this very powerful company we know as Amazon. It's been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for listening.